ladies and gentlemen, here in Hollywood and our global webcast audience, we welcome you all to this very special event, the 25th anniversary celebration of the L. Ron Hubbard Achievement Awards.
A culture is as rich and capable of surviving as it has imaginative artists. It is with this in mind that I initiated a means for new and budding writers to have a chance for their creative efforts to be seen and acknowledged. These words, written by philosopher and best-selling writer L. Ron Hubbard 25 years ago, have changed the lives of thousands who have entered a contest that bears his name. The L. Ron Hubbard's Writers of the Future Contest. In each of those years, a dozen or so would-be writers have been welcomed into the world of science fiction and fantasy as published professionals, and countless others have been inspired to keep writing, keep entering, and keep dreaming their vision of the future. L. Ron Hubbard understood that vision well, as only a fellow writer can. Beginning in the 1930s, Hubbard was one of the most prolific writers of the golden age of pulp fiction magazine publishing. Writing under multiple pen names for multiple magazines, he produced hundreds of fiction stories, shorts to novel length, in virtually every popular genre, from westerns and mysteries to land, air, and sea adventures. It was his keen interest in science and space and the allure of worlds of fantasy where Hubbard made his indelible mark, writing classics like Fear, Final Blackout, Slaves of Sleep, Typewriter in the Sky, To the Stars, and the old Doc Methuselah series, all of which continue to be entertaining and thought-provoking. As successful as he was during these years, Hubbard was equally determined to help other writers succeed. He wrote classic how-to articles on writing, gave lectures, and headed the New York chapter of the American Fiction Guild. In the early 1940s, Hubbard even funded a small writing contest to inspire beginning writers, setting the stage for what was to come. In 1983, after a three-decade hiatus, L. Ron Hubbard returned to fiction writing in epic style by authoring the New York Times best-selling Battlefield Earth, followed by the 10-volume internationally best-selling Mission Earth series. While cementing his literary legacy with these two huge works, Hubbard wished to continue his other legacy, helping new talents carry on the mantle of the speculative fiction genre in which he flourished. Hubbard created a new contest for new writers never professionally published. An all-star jury of writing greats would serve as judges. Entries would be free, with meaningful cash prizes and stylish awards. The contest would publish an ongoing print anthology and further encourage the winning writers with a week-long workshop led by renowned professionals. The response was, and continues to be, magic. Hundreds of submissions came pouring in within months. From them came a significant handful of publishing gems. Over 25 years, overseen by speculative fiction's elite, the contest has easily become the gold standard for science fiction and fantasy writers to measure their work. Now, thousands of entries arrive each quarter from across the globe, and the contest's anthologies form a must-read list of who's hot and new in speculative fiction. In that same quarter century, the Writers of the Future contest has seen the passing of the literary torch. As some of its earliest writer judges have left us, others have taken up the call, including some contest alums, continuing L. Ron Hubbard's tradition of paying forward to foster the future. And what began as Hubbard's legacy for writers has transformed into something far greater, a beacon of creative spirit. Its success has given rise to the equally impressive and respected Illustrators of the Future contest, now in its 19th year, with professional judges selecting artists who push the vision of speculative fiction and graphic arts ever forward. The collective spirit of the contests also has inspired a host of activities, an International Writers' Symposium at the United Nations, a celebration of literary history at the Library of Congress, discussions at NASA, Cape Canaveral, Caltech, Seattle's Science Fiction Museum, San Diego's Air and Space Museum, and multiple events at the epicenter of film entertainment. Creative stars of all types have cast their glow on the contests. Science visionaries, authors, astronauts, artists, actors, and actresses. Hundreds of civic and community proclamations have honored the contest's impact on publishing, equality, and exploration. 
among them Publishers Weekly calling the Writers of the Future contest the most enduring forum to showcase new talent in the genre. To date, more than 600 aspiring writers and artists have been given the chance to have successful professional careers through the contests, not counting the numerous unchosen entrants who continue to pursue their publishing dreams, driven by the encouragement of the judges and the contests. The contest's winners have gone on to publish well over 500 novels, 3,000 short stories, and more than 3 million illustrations in the field. L. Ron Hubbard once wrote that science fiction does not come after the fact of a scientific discovery or development. It is the herald of possibility. It is the plea that someone should work on the future. Yet it is not prophecy. It is the dream that precedes the dawn. For a quarter century, L. Ron Hubbard's Writers and Illustrators of the Future contests have inspired writers and artists to dream of that future. It is with satisfaction and respect for what has transpired, and with the thrill of anticipation primed for what is to come, that we unlock the vault to another generation of dreams and reveal the inspired dawns which await the next 25 years of Writers and Illustrators of the Future. Please welcome our Mistress of Ceremonies from Author Services, Executive Director for Fiction Affairs, Ms. Gunhild Jacobs. Thank you very much. It was in this very room in 1929 that the first Academy Awards ceremony took place with the legendary actor Douglas Fairbanks and singer Al Jolson presenting each of the evening's 13 Oscars. Tonight is another type of historic event, a truly momentous occasion celebrating 25 years of discovering new talent in all aspects of speculative fiction. For it was... For it was in the first volume of the Writers of the Future that L. Ron Hubbard stated, the artist injects the spirit of life into a culture, and through his creative endeavors, the writer works continually to give tomorrow a new form. In these modern times, there are many communication lines for works of art. Because a few works of art can be shown so easily to so many, there may even be fewer artists. The competition is very keen and even dagger sharp. And upon those words was launched what has since become the most successful merit competition of its kind in the world. So, on behalf of everyone at Author Services, the literary agency of L. Ron Hubbard, Galaxy Press, the publisher of the L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future Anthology, and the esteemed judges of this contest, let me welcome each and every one of you this evening as we honor the winners of this year's Writers and Illustrators of the Future contests. We have received numerous letters of congratulations from those unable to attend, and I would like to take a few moments to share a few of these with you. Science fiction grandmaster Anne McCaffrey sent in these words. First, let me mention how very much I wish I were also there, but at 83, even air travel is difficult and taxing. I miss the adventure of meeting new writers and artists of our special genre, especially when they are recipients of the generosity of L. Ron Hubbard, whose early career made him so aware of the problems of writing in general and of science fiction in particular, that he set up the scheme of writers and artists of the future to assist dreamers to realize their potentials. Not only are you here to learn more about your future, you are able to recognize the most important aspect, becoming published. Lift your glasses and your hearts to the fact that this is the 25th anniversary of the contest. It is a constant satisfaction to me to have been a judge in this wonderful program. And from the associate publisher of Publishers Weekly, congratulations to the writers and illustrators of the future contest. 
May you always remain that powerful statement of faith as well as direction in science fiction. And from the Association of American Publishers. The Association of American Publishers would like to congratulate the writers of the future winners for their boundless creativity, perseverance, and contribution in raising the bar with new and exciting stories which will help shape current and future generations of engaged readers. Founding contest judge and science fiction grandmaster Robert Silverberg wrote, Writing is not an easy profession, and the path to a professional career is a daunting one. The Writers of the Future contest is unique in its dedication to developing great writing careers. My congratulations to you all and to the program for its splendid efforts over these many years. And physics professor Gregory Benford, Nebula Award winner and advisor to the Department of Energy, NASA, and the White House, and the only other judge to have been with us since the inception of the contest sent in these words. I salute all those at the Writers of the Future 25th Anniversary Celebration, an astonishing event. I'm sorry I can't be there to see so many friends celebrate and move forward into a future with even more fresh new writers who can frame the future for us all. We have among us tonight a special number of guests that I would like to call to your attention. Not only do we have the winners of the 25th year of the contest, but a number of past winners as well as many aspiring writers and illustrators who have entered the contest and who are with us tonight. Will all past winners and entrants please stand up and be acknowledged. We have many more distinguished guests. Please hold your applause till all are announced. Thank you. She recently starred in the NBC miniseries The Storm and on Fox's award-winning show 24, actress Marisol Nichols. <laughs> he stars in Fox's popular series Bones, actor John Francis Daly. This actor has appeared in films such as Apollo 13, The Grinch, and last year's Oscar-nominated Frost Nixon. He can be seen on NBC's Parks and Recreation, and he was the senior director for the L. Ron Harvard Stories from the Golden Age audiobooks, in which he also performed Jim Meskimen. As seen for the past seven seasons on the international hit show CSI Miami, Sophia Milos. Director, screenwriter, and part of the Academy Award-winning team for visual effects on the movie Titanic, and Emmy Award winner for visual effects for Star Trek Voyager, Grant Boucher, star of the hit series Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, and the leading role of Captain Dylan Hunt in Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, Kevin Sorbo. From the HBO series The Wire and A&E's The First 48, Dion Graham, editor of Locus Magazine, Amelia Beamer, from The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, comedian, voice actor, and celebrity impressionist Josh Robert Thompson. <laughs> Multiple TV stage and animation actress Christina Huntington. From Sci-Fi Channel's Lex, Napoleon Dynamite, and the international series The Collector, Gemini Award nominee Ellen Dubin a founding member of the three-time Grammy-nominated Firesign Theater, which will be performing in Hollywood in October. He is the voice of Howard on the Emmy Award-winning Rugrats, Seahorse Bob in Finding Nemo, and Charlie in Monsters, Inc., Phil Proctor. <laughs> Appearing in the soon-to-be-released comedy film Kissing Strangers, actress Jenny Sommerfeld. Let's give them all a warm welcome. And now we present our judges in attendance. These talented professionals mark both the rich past and present of speculative fiction and illustration. Again, I ask that you hold your applause until all of these amazing individuals are announced. 
perennial book award favorite and author of 100 books and now a record producer as well, Kevin J. Anderson. 1993's Writers' Contest winner and now Australia's leading science fiction writer, Mr. Sean Williams. New York Times best-selling author of Star Wars Young Jedi series, Rebecca Mesta. Former writer, contest winner, and successful novelist, who is now not only the contest's first reader, but is also the editor for Writers of the Future, Katie Wentworth. Award-winning illustrator and longtime illustrator, Judge Dr. Laura Brodian Fries. Science fiction author, editor, holder of NASA's Achievement Medal and the Isaac Asimov Memorial Award, Dr. Yoji Kondo. Multi-major award winner and best-selling author, editor, the legendary Dr. Jerry Purnell. <laughs> Master of visual communications in multiple genres, coordinating illustrator judge, Ron Lindan. Philip K. Dick and World Fantasy Award winner and lead workshop instructor, Judge Tim, Tim Powers. Hugo nominee and Art Award winner and Illustrator's Judge since the contest began, Val Lakey Lindan. 1985 contest winner, multiple novelist and Bram Stoker Award winner, Nina Kiriki Hoffman. Known as the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction and winner of every major science fiction award, Robert J. Sawyer. A laboratory director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, he's authored 14 novels and hundreds of other publications, Doc Beeson. <laughs> Winner of Hugo and five Chesley Awards, he's illustrated for 30 years with over 450 covers, artist Stephen Hickman. A former contest grand prize winner, he's published 30 plus novels under his pen name David Farlan and real name Dave Wolverton. To these esteemed judges, present and those unable to attend, thank you for contributing your time and talent to the discovery of our world's new visionary storytellers and illustrators. You are the true treasure of these contests. Please stand up and be warmly acknowledged. Our first guest speaker is a renowned scientist and technologist and the first and only person in the world to earn two PhDs simultaneously in any discipline. He earned his degrees at Purdue University, one in physics and the other in chemistry. He was the chief science advisor of the famed $10 million X Prize contest and for the last 12 years has worked in Hollywood as a writer and producer of various science fiction TV programs. He is the co-director as well as the writer and producer of Quantum Quest, a 3D CGI science fiction adventure due out on IMAX screens in 2010. Please welcome Dr. Harry Clore. Well, in the future, they're going to figure out how to make these smaller. Maybe someday they'll actually fit in our pocket. It's a great honor to be here today. A lot of time I hear people say that, um, but I really do mean it. Um, in this audience are a lot of writers, uh, going back uh, even to my childhood, uh, which really inspired me to become a scientist. Uh, it was through science fiction that I saw the wonder of the universe and the possibilities of the universe. And so science fiction is what truly led me on the road to become a scientist, and it is then science that actually led me back to also want to be a screenwriter and a science fiction filmmaker. Now I could spend enough time that John Goodwin would come up with a big hook and pull me off stage, <laughs> listing all the science fiction writers that uh, have influenced me. But instead what I'd like to do is name the first science fiction writer that influenced me. A uh, writer by the name of Mary Conway. She wrote a single science fiction book called My Beloved uh, Troshanas. I almost missed that name. And it was actually a romantic science fiction. And it was full of all the science fiction predictions that you know, were popular in the 60s, included things like microwaves and cell phones and all kinds of wonderful things. But the reason it was so impactful to me is because it was written by my mother while I was in her womb. <laughs> so
So I want to thank my mom for uh, leading me to pretty much my entire uh, life and career and love. It was really through my mom that I started reading science fiction books. It's you know pretty cool to have your mom go, here's some comic books and here's a book by Highlander or Clark. Um, I come here today from both uh, posting, uh, I'm in the middle of my mix of a, the Quantum Quest movie, which I'm going to talk about in a moment because we're going to uh, run a clip on it. And, uh, but I also come uh, from the uh, graduation ceremonies um, at uh, NASA Ames, which is in Silicon Valley, for two universities that I think um, many of the writers here would really enjoy stopping by next year, wherever they happen to be, and getting involved in. And these universities are the International Space University and a new university that just started this year called the Singularity University. Now I attended the first uh, year of, Sing of International Space University at MIT, uh, created by Dr. Peter Diamandis um, in 1988. And it is uh, this university that brings together uh, the leaders of tomorrow, just like you guys are the leaders for writing in the future, it's the leaders for space exploration and space, um, both in government and in the private enterprise, at the postgraduate level. And um, this year, we also launched a university, both universities created by, by Peter, but I was involved in this one, uh, and the Singularity University is a science fiction writer's dream. It certainly was one for me. It was where I could really be a scientist and a science fiction writer. And it was one where we brought together the experts in nanotechnology, robotics, artificial intelligence, bioinformation, space, energy, genetics, cybernetics, you name it. And a student body of about 40 of the most smartest students that, that we could find to intermix that were involved in these technologies. Um, and bring them together to learn each other's disciplines, but also to face like, and explore some of the consequences of things that you all put into your books. And here, since your science fiction writings are becoming um, the reality of tomorrow, um, we actually wanted our future leaders to take seriously um, ethics and morals and the dangers of things like artificial intelligence. For instance, at what point do we really have to be cautious if we create an artificial intelligence program that actually is alive and awake and aware and yet is thinking a million times faster than us? Perhaps it might think we're irrelevant. Um, but we also looked at issues such as in robotics. Right now there's advertisements about robotic cars. Well, how much intelligence do you want to give to a robotic car? You know, do you let it decide for you that you've drank too much and where it's going to take you and what it's going to do. So these are real issues that we explored. So I'm sure I'm already over my time. Um, so I'm going to jump quickly to uh, talk about my film because my film is actually a combination of both of my careers, my science career and my science fiction career. The film Quantum Quest involves uh, about I don't know, somewhere between three and $10 billion in space imagery and radar data. Um, the film is a science fantasy in the sense that uh, the main characters are photons and protons and neutrinos that, God forbid, can actually talk um, and run around. Uh, but they, it, it, the point of, the, of this project was, was to approach science from the point of view of people who don't like it. People who don't want to learn about a photon or a proton or could care less about uh, the discoveries we made in space. It's not that they don't really care, it's just that they've never had it in a palatable form. And they've never fed on science fiction, because if they had, they'd love it. Um, and so this movie involves bringing that together in a science fiction format. The cast for this film is, involves two Kirks and two Vaders. And I threw in Mark Hamill as a uh, referee. So we have Chris Pine and William Shatner. We have Hayden Christensen and James Earl Jones. And we also have Sam Jackson, Amanda Peet, Sandra Oh, Jason Alexandra, Abigail Breslin, Spencer Breslin, um, Brent Spiner, Rob Picardo. I could keep going. I'm forgetting other people. Um, but uh, we also have Neil Armstrong in his first ever appearance in a film. And for me, that was great. Um, the film also will bring real space discoveries to the public. So when you see the spider craters on Mercury, you're really seeing the spider craters on Mercury. And you'll be seeing this in 3D. You get to visit Venus, you get to go to Mars, and at the end you get to go surfing over the surface of Titan. 
The whole point of this is to bring this to a public through the science fiction media because just as it inspired me to see the possibilities of science and to explore science, my hope is by using science fiction um, to tease people into getting an interest in science. So um, with that, I think we're going to roll this clip with one caveat. Keep in mind that none of this is six months old, so the visuals are about 60% and you're not going to hear any of Skywalker's beautiful work. So uh, let's roll the clip. Simple photon. You have such a Don't you waste a second. I, I just don't see any point in bouncing around the cold, dark vacuum of space. Oh, no. oh, oh. Oh, no. Oops. That is a smart ranger. You let her escape. We have a problem. Admiral Fear. The Earthlings must not discover Titan's secrets. The ranger must be stopped before she can warn Cassini. Kelman Ghost, the message in this gem must reach the Cassini commander. We must get there in less than two hours. We'll never get there that fast. The fate of trillions depends on it, Dave. This young photon, Dave, escaped with a message. I don't know any Cassini commander. But I totally know where Saturn hangs. We can ride the solar winds all the way there. That was sweet. Woo! Ring City. You sure you don't want to come with us to Neptune? I made a promise to Reyna. I have to finish the mission. Antimatter fleet is on its way to attack you. But some part of you needs to be protected, all right? You gotta do something. You've got to. Dave, the antenna is at 85% of the base. I'll destroy you all. Our next guest speaker is an Explorers Club member, Commissioner and Managing Director of what will be the most viewed competitive event in man's history. To speak to you about this and the role of science fiction played bringing this about, please welcome Don Hartzell of the World Air League. Well, greetings and good evening. 
First of all, I want to say thank you to our kind host, L. Ron Hubbard, and all of those that are part of his world and lives. We have them to appreciate, and this is why we're here. I'm looking out at you, and, and frankly, I'm, I've seen a few of you over these last couple of days, and I'm going to have to say this. We dress up well, don't we? <laughs> all right, let's give ourselves a round of applause. And first of all, this is for the people we're here to honor. You know, as a child, when I first started reading, I started reading science fiction. This is what started my imagination growing. It started at exploring. For me, there were no impossible limitations, no boundaries, no boxes in which my thoughts could be put. There was science fiction, and then there were science facts. I grew up at a time when man was reaching for the moon and dreaming of the stars beyond. It was science fiction that got me thinking and wondering, where is technology going? Where could it go? But it was the explorer within me that made me ask, what did we miss by not taking that path? Which experiment should we have pursued? And one of my fascinations has been to explore lost technologies, or more appropriately, technologies of lost arts. Faded out of existence should they have a second chance. And so one such technology is lighter than air travel. Consider the Zeppelin. Think about man's ascent into the heavens by the balloon. In the earliest of science fiction, Jules Verne wrote of touring and conquering around the world in 80 days. From this vision, I personally have been inspired. And so for now, more than 30 years in the planning, my own dream is now coming to fruition. And it's because of what you do as writers of science fiction and fantasy that I am honored here to be a part of this program that provides recognition for those who would dare to create, share their dreams of worlds imagined, visions realized, and science created. From this inspiration, I must say, I'm lucky. I know why indeed I am lucky. We are lucky because the vision of L. Ron Hubbard has grown and created this very event, the opportunity that we're here to celebrate, the Writers of the Futures. And its award is about looking at the blueprints of the future of mankind, or perhaps better said, that which we have discovered, a map that will chart our future and our future possibilities. Now, why am I here? What did I discover within me? What inspired me? Well, it was in 1976, during the time of our 200th birthday, as a nation, as we were celebrating our glorious bicentennial. I, at that time, was a hobo. I was a hitchhiker. I hopped freight trains. So I went from Texas. I wanted to see our nation's capital. And I wanted to see the bicentennial because I knew that I was not going to live to see the tricentennial. So time was to make the most of it, and that was then. And so in my travels, I stood in front of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia on the 4th of July in 1976. I was at the official opening of the nation's birthday celebration in front of the National Archives. I got signed one of the documents that said that I was there, and it's going to be opened at the tricentennial. From there, I made it to New York just in time to watch the ending of the celebrations there where the tall ships were coming down the Hudson River. So standing on the shores of Manhattan Island, I was there to see these majestic beauties under full sail glide down the Hudson River. The sky was blue, the men were proud, the children were playing, and of course the women were beautiful. And so we're looking at clouds that were white, serene blue, and but Amongst all this pageantry, I stood back and I looked southwards to Liberty Island and just above the outstretched torch of the Statue of Liberty, just above her hand was the Goodyear blimp. I took a photograph. Now, pictures are something that are to remind us of who we were and where we were. Well, this particular photograph, it has been a seed and it's one that I return to from time and time again. It seeded my imagination. And from it, I first conceived this vision, 
and what it is to have a full scale of zeppelins and skyships and have them compete for daring, glory, and fame. Now this dream, this imagined dream is now turning to fact and is supported by science facts and science technology of today. To give this dream reality, I have formed the World Air League and I have scheduled a historic race around the planet. We're going to see skyships from countries all around the world competing in the World Sky Race. This is a series of races, 16 of them back to back, 30,000 miles in length, a competition that is going to traverse the entire globe. It starts on the Greenwich Prime Meridian, the very dividing line between the east and western hemispheres of the world. It's going to be in front of the atomic clock where all time on Earth is synchronized. It's going to race down the uh, Thames River. It's going to go over the Tower of London Bridge. It's going to go next to the Millennium Eye, past Big Ben, and Houses of Parliament. And that's for starters. From there, it goes to Berlin, and then to the Roman Colosseum, then the pyramids, the Middle East, the Taj Mahal, the Twin Towers of Malaysia, then the Great Wall, Mount Fujiyama, Hawaii, here, the Golden Gate Bridge, down to Central America, then to Texas, and then the Statue of Liberty. Then, it's back to the Prime Meridian. If this was a perfect world, we could do this race perfectly in 25 days, but it's around the world in 180 days. This race will be used as a bridge to connect the globe and to highlight our planet's incredible cultural diversity. Educationally, this race is going to serve as an inspiration for schools and school children around the world. This race will be used to focus in those schoolrooms the lessons on history and geography over the entire planet. In the last three years, I have personally been around the world eight times. And that's just to put this race together, just to get it started. First, I had to establish that there was a collective political will that countries around the world would open their air and give us the air rights to travel. And so now that we've established that, I've gone from wearing out shoe leather to having UNESCO as our organizing partner. We have endorsements from the United Kingdom, from Germany, from India, Malaysia, Vietnam, Japan, and Mexico. Everywhere around the world, people see the World Sky Race as an opportunity to create harmony and goodwill. Now let's talk about size. In terms of live spectators, at the last Olympics, they estimate maybe three, maybe five million people max actually went to the games and sat in the stadiums and watched the competitions live. We're going to beat the Olympics in one day in terms of live spectators. Now I'm talking about real eyeballs, not TV, not the newspapers, not the internet. All we have to do to beat the Olympics is just fly over the city of Los Angeles and <laughs> Now, now I'm from Texas, and so I'm allowed to talk in a couple of superlatives. So here you go. As a man-made event, a sporting event, an entertainment event, the World Sky Race is going to be the most viewed event in the entire history of the human race by live spectators. Now that's big. <laughs> Well, but wait, there's more. <laughs> this race is environmentally green. It's very green. On top of that, the race is packed with iconic visuals and monumental drama. With UNESCO as our partner, we're going to be flying over more than 130 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. You know, I've even received a letter from Dr. Zahi Hawass. 
He's the Secretary General of Egyptian Antiquities, and y'all may know him. He's the guy that's on National Geographic all the time. Now, he is the man who controls the pyramids. He's given us his, his personal permission to land the skyships south of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, specifically south of the third pyramid in the desert. Now, how's that for a parking permit? <laughs> Now, has science fiction inspired our humanity? Does it give us a way to explore our paths and other paths and dream? I'm simply looking at you and I simply say, stay inspired. Tonight, there's energy in this room. We share, we connect. We have our futures together to explore. Live your dream and share your dreams. And now, I have a special announcement to make on behalf of the World Air League, that in addition to the stellar awards that you're about to be presented, tonight's two grand prize winners are going to be each awarded a ceremonial milestone VIP ride on one of the competing skyships in the World Sky Race. I want to say thank you, thank you very much, and congratulations. Keep your imaginations flying above and beyond. Now, from Locust Magazine, please welcome Amelia Beamer for a special presentation. I would like to present this award of excellence to L. Ron Hubbard's Writers and Illustrators of the Future contests in recognition of 25 years of fostering new writers and artists and providing a chance for their creative efforts to be seen and acknowledged, and so helping to provide for the future of science fiction and fantasy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker has been directly involved with the publishing of L. Ron Hubbard's works and the Writers of the Future series since 1986. Please welcome the President of Galaxy Press, Mr. John Goodwin. Thank you. Each year, the L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future Anthology provides a worldwide showcase for the best new authors and illustrators of science fiction and fantasy. As in previous years, this volume features the year's winning stories, illustrations by winning artists, and inspirational articles by a few of our judges on the craft and practical business of creating. Those words of wisdom this year come from master writer Robert Silverberg, versatile creative artist Ron Lindon, and a special, never-before-published article on writing taken from a 1982 interview with L. Ron Hubbard commemorating his 50 years as a professional writer and release of his New York Times bestseller, Battlefield Earth. Over the past several years, we have made the Writers of the Future anthology available for use in high school and college writing programs. This series has become the standard that aspiring writers use to determine just how good one needs to be to be considered good. Our anthologies are on the shelves of educators, authors, and illustrators all over the world, while universities such as Cornell, Rutgers, George Washington, and Harvard have long used our anthology stories and advice as texts in creative writing classes. All of which goes to say that this volume indeed represents the shape of our tomorrows as authored and illustrated by the best new talent on Earth. So on behalf of Author Services and Galaxy Press, I would like to offer our heartfelt congratulations to all the contest winners appearing in this, the newest volume of this series. 
As a special gift, all attendees at tonight's celebration will receive complimentary copies of the book. Tonight's winners are poised to have long, successful careers, and you can get their first autographs from them right here. <laughs> it is now my honor and privilege to officially release L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future, Volume 25. The anthology's 12 stories and illustrations pair a verbal vision of an imaginative plot with a one-panel artistic window that lets readers graphically glimpse the written world. We now present individual achievement awards to the writer and illustrator for each of these wonderful works in the order they appear in the book. Please welcome judges Kevin J. Anderson and Val Lakey Lindan. Um, just in case there's room, I wouldn't mind going on that World Air Race thing, too. <laughs> Our anthology's first story is called The Garden of Chen Zi. Its author is a quarterly first place winner, Emery Huang, of Orlando, Florida. I tried to pronounce it right. Emery says he wants to write stories that meld China's vast cultural traditions with American fantasy. His tale finds hope in the face of a bleak future hidden deep in China's wilderness. Please welcome Emery Huang. Hi everyone, it's an honor to be here. 
Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking L. Ron Hubbard, both for the contest and for his tremendous influence in the genre. I'd like to thank the writers of the future contest and everyone involved in it. This has been an amazing week and you all made it possible. I'd also like to thank my girlfriend, Ashley Catt, for being my wise reader and giving me the support I needed throughout my development as a writer. And lastly, I'd like to thank my parents for letting me buy the many books I've acquired over the years with their credit card. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. What a spectacular night. The garden of TNZ's illustrator is Douglas Bosley of Washington State. His interests range from oil painting to printmaking and from philosophy to cybernetics, many of which come to play in his dark portrayal of the story. Please welcome Douglas Bosley. <laughs> I would just like to thank the uh, people who, who taught me, my educators, my peers, and the hardworking faculty and staff at the Western Washington University, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. I also need to thank the uh, Edmonds Art Festival Foundation and the Albert K. Murray Foundation for financing my education and helping me along the way. But finally, I'd also like to thank Mr. Hubbard for uh, enabling the possibility and the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Please welcome judges Doug Neeson and Laura Brody and Freeze. Good evening. Our anthology's second story, The Shadow Man, is authored by another quarterly first place winner, Donald Mead of Bloomington, Illinois. Don used comments from Judge Katie Wentworth to revise a past unsuccessful entry into his first successful sale. The Shadow Man is Don's third story success and shows his deep respect for the Japanese culture and for the lost voices of Hiroshima. Please join me in congratulating Don Mead. I'm the old man. <laughs> For 25 years, L. Ron Hubbard's Writers of the Future contest has provided a gateway for new talent to make that transition to professional sales. The list of people who have, become, who have come before me is like a who's who of the, the it is the who's who of the writing industry for our genre, and I walk in the footsteps of giants. Thank you. A multiple art contest winner and now a gaming company designer, winner Bree Ann Hills, of Billerica, Massachusetts, loves writing and illustrating her own short stories and poetry. 
Her 3D illustration work beautifully influences the deep mysteries of the shadow man. Please welcome Brianne Hills. very thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, I don't think I would even be here um, if I hadn't had the courage to submit my artwork to this competition. Um, I think fear sometimes really holds us back, especially artists. Um, I'm just very thankful for everyone involved with this, this competition, um, everyone down to my hairstylist and <laughs> my makeup artist. Um, I read more of my notes, but I drew pictures all over it. <laughs> so, uh, this is to having a moment of courage for submitting to this contest. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome Judge Yoji Kondo and presenter Marisol Nichols. I'm obviously not um, this attractive young lady. <laughs> okay, uh, well, the first award we are handing out was to Gray Lin A.R. of Eugene, Oregon, began, he began writing fiction just four years ago after being notified of his contest award early this year. Gray has seen a string of multiple publication sales and publishing roles come his way. The anthology's third story, Life in Stream, examine the possibility of the divine existence in the worst of man-made uh, plots. Congratulations, great Lina Ahn. Um, I can't possibly thank everyone who deserves it, but I wanted to at least say that I wouldn't be a writer at all if it weren't for Nina and Jai, and I wouldn't be at the place I am now in my career if not for Sarah and Emily and my writing gang. I'm overwhelmed by the generosity of everyone here, and in particular to L. Ron Hubbard for just making this happen for all of us. I was thinking about why I write, and ultimately, I think the best that any of us can do is to reach out to each other. It's painfully hard sometimes to get what's in here to you, and um, I think whether it's art or words, we're all just trying to understand and connect. So I just wanted to say to you, thank you for taking your experience as human beings and collecting people's stories and filtering them back into the world so that we can connect. I'm touched and humbled to be in your presence. Thank you.
Our illustrator for Life in Steam is Ryan Behrens of Olympia, Washington. Ryan's been painting for seven years and drawing all his life. Happily, he chose illustrators for his first contest entry anywhere. His animation and comic book work clearly influence his illustration for this story. Please congratulate Ryan Behrens. I just want to be quick. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here and for everyone that worked so hard to put this night together and uh, make it a special night for me, the writers, and the illustrators. Thank you. Please welcome Judge Nina Kariki Hoffman and presenter Jim Meskimen. Fiona Lane of Vancouver, British Columbia, has had short pieces published in local magazines and e-zines. Fiona's first professional sale is the anthology's fourth story. The assignment of runner ETI shows what it takes to win when running for charity also means running for your life. Congratulations to Fiona Lane. see it. Um, thank you so much. My story, The Assignment of Runner ETI, evolved over the better part of a year. I owe many thanks to those who encouraged me, read the story, some read the story more than once, and kept the home fires burning while I was out learning how it felt to be a long-distance runner. Special thanks to Dan Hay, John Pohl, David, Marta, Michaela, Paul, Dirk, and Maury. Thank you to L. Ron Hubbard and everyone at Author Services and Galaxy Press. This is a fantastic program, and the pun is kind of intended. It's, um, it truly is fabulous. I feel proud and lucky to, to be here to participate in it. Uh, to Katie Wentworth and Tim Powers, thank you for your wisdom, your patience, and your candor. When I finished writing this story, I experienced what I call postal paralysis. I, I just couldn't send it out. I, I, I felt like the high school graduate who hesitates to choose one career path for fear of missing out on another or for fear of universal failure. I mentioned this to a friend of mine and he asked me, where do you most want to send it? And I said, writers of the future, but maybe I'm just too ambitious to think they would want my work. He said, be ambitious, Fiona. It's good advice. It got me here, and it can get you wherever you want to go. Luck be with you in all your endeavors, and thank you for this. A.R. Stone infuses art with the intensity and gentleness gained from A.R.'s own varied experiences in Los Angeles, Denver, and now Oregon. Spurred by the contest award, A.R. produced over 300 illustrations last year, including the dramatic scene for the assignment of Runner ETI. A.R. unfortunately was able, unable to be with us this evening, so please 
let's all just acknowledge A.R. Stone. Please welcome Judge Rebecca Mesta and presenter John Francis Daly. Our anthology's fifth story was penned by Heather McDougall. Heather tends chickens, bees, and vegetables at her Davenport, California home while working on her fourth novel. In Heather's winning entry, the candy store, Everything Sweet is for Sale, If You Can Afford the Devilish Price, please congratulate Heather McDougall. pockets to carry these. <laughs> um, at Worldcon last year in Denver, um, my friends and I were lurking in the lobby of our hotel. Worldcon is the World Science Fiction Con Convention, for those of you who don't know. Um, we were trying to decide what to do at 2 in the morning. Uh, and we bumped into this man who was simply beaming. He was just ecstatic. We could just tell from his face. Um, so we asked him why he was so happy, and he told us he just got a five-book deal. My friends and I, of course, then bundled him into the elevator and took him upstairs and said, you have to tell us what you did. So the secret of, of his success, um, his name was Ken Scholes. Perhaps some of you know him. Um, and what he said was, if you do nothing else, you must keep writing short stories, and you must keep submitting them to writers of the future until you win. <laughs> he said it's the best thing you could possibly do for your career. And you know, he was right, I think. I'd like to thank my husband for supporting my rabbit writing habit through everything and taking care of the kids while I do that. I'd also like to thank all my friends at Second Breakfast, which is my writing group, for all their good advice. And mostly I'd like to thank my parents for continuing to believe in me, even though I didn't believe in myself for such a long time. Thank you. Illustrator for The Candy Store is Jamie Loon of Myersville, Maryland. Jamie rocked and rolled for more than a decade, but finally turned to another passion, drawing to make a living. In his story illustration, he draws from the visual and musical to create a spare but engaging style. Please welcome Jamie Loom. Yeah, this will be short also. Well, gotta thank L. Ron Hubbard, of course, and uh, Joni Labaki, and all the artists that spoke with us this week. Um, and there are so many other people involved, it, it blew my mind. This, this, this is crazy, so it's great. Thank you very much. Please welcome Judge Sean Williams and presenter Jenny Sommerfeld. The author of the anthology's sixth story 
is Mike Wood from Northwest England. By day, he's an accountant. <laughs> By night, he's either writing or playing in big bands. His entry, Risk Man, pairs a male ex-cop turned artist with a female math genius whose calculations could as easily destroy the world as save it. Please applaud Mike Wood. a long, long list here. I'll try and summarise it down a little. First of all, right at the top of that list, thank you to Sarah, my wife. She puts up with my moods and is always there to say, hey, shouldn't you be writing? It's a reclusive thing. You go and lock yourself in a room for a long time and, uh, you know, it can be difficult. I'd like to thank also Tim Powers and Katie Wentworth, our workshop tutors and all the judges and past winners who've given their time here so generously. Thank you to everyone at Author Services and Galaxy Press, and I mean everyone, for the event, the book, the organisation, it's just, it's incredible. Thank you to the other winners, and writers and illustrators for their friendship and support during this week. And finally, none of this could have happened without Mr. L. Ron Hubbard. Thank you everyone. Riskman's illustrator is Evan Jensen of Annapolis, Maryland. Evan began sketching out strange creations in his childhood room. By the time he was in college, Evan was illustrating creatures great and small, which began to populate places Evan would inhabit as an artist. Today, Evan is still creating new treasures with his artwork, as can be seen in Riskman. Please congratulate Evan Jensen. Mine's probably going to be pretty short too, but uh, pursuing a career in illustration is often looked askance upon for one reason or another, but I really couldn't and wouldn't do a damn thing else, so I'd like to thank um, everyone who's given me the support and the opportunity to do that, um, from my parents and uh, my late great uncle, Jens, who's also an artist, my grandparents, uh, my mate Lisa, and everyone here this week who's been so incredibly wonderful and generous and, and giving and everyone abroad who's allowed me to um, shove my artwork in their direction every now and then. So thank you very much. Please welcome Judge Dr. Jerry Purnell and presenter Christina Huntington. Excuse me just a second while I tweet. <laughs> there. The seventh work in the anthology was written by Sean M. Zwachman of Cottage Grove, Minnesota. A former naval officer, interestingly they've got, there it is, said Sean returned to writing after completing military service. A 2006 contest semifinalist Sean's eighth entry is this story, Great Queen Homecoming, which tests the working relationship of a man, an artificial woman, trying to survive in space. Please congratulate Sean M. Zwachman.
I know what some of you must be thinking, formal naval officer, robotic women. <laughs> I guarantee you the story is not like that. <laughs> I'd like to begin by thanking my parents for their incessant support, for believing in me when I doubted. I'd also like to thank my sister, Dawn, who is my first and sometimes only reader, who has consistently provided me with the painfully honest advice that I ask her for so that I can continue improving my writing. Lastly, I'd like to thank Mr. Hubbard for endowing the contest, for all the judges for their inspiring work and their words of wisdom, and all my fellow writers and illustrators who have made this past week truly spectacular. Thank you very much. Mesa, Arizona resident Tobias A. Fruget has used drawing to help him behave in church as a boy, wait for his mom to finish working, and even survive a low point in prison. His experience and singular style effectively convey both isolation and danger in his drawing for Grey Queen Homecoming. Please applaud Tobias Fruget. Wow, this is great. First of all, I want to thank my parents and my family who are always there to encourage me in art and to help me to pursue to be an illustrator. Also, I'd like to thank the judges and all the people who committed their time and effort to make this possible in the L. Ron Hubbard Illustrators of the Future. Thank you. Please welcome judges Robert J. Sawyer and Ron Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Krista Hepner Leahy of Brooklyn, New York, turned her time at New Hampshire's prestigious Odyssey Writing Workshop to good advantage in writing her winning contest entry. The Dizzy Bridge is the anthology's eighth story and poetically crosses the chasm between opposites, illusion and reality, young and old, mind and heart. Please applaud Krista Hepner Leahy. Hi everyone, um, it really has been an amazing week and I feel deeply lucky and honored to be here um, to the wonderful, hardworking, tireless people of Author Services and Galaxy Press, especially I have to mention Joni Labaki and John Goodwin, um, to uh, Mr. Hubbard's generosity and vision in establishing and funding this contest to K.D. Wentworth and Tim Powers for an extraordinary week. To all of the judges, past pros, current pros, I guess I'm thanking those people that are no longer with us. <laughs> uh, and anyone who has come here and welcomed us with such candor 
and grace and generosity to all of my fellow writers and illustrators, especially Aaron Aronson, who did such a beautiful illustration of my story. Thank you for making this week so memorable and wonderful. To all of those people in my life who have supported me in my writing and to helping me write this particular story, to every single member of my family, to my friends, to Jean Cavellos, to all of my odd fellow chickens, to my New York City salooners, to my camarado, Jay. I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks and ever thanks. I stole the words, but the thanks are sincere. Are we having fun or what? The illustrator for The Dizzy Bridge is Aaron Anderson of Pleasant Grove, Utah. Aaron comes from a family of readers, but was particularly attracted to the covers of his father's sci-fi and fantasy collection. Self-trained until a few years ago, Aaron's work blends the classics with the contemporary. Please congratulate Aaron Anderson. I think the most important thing uh, for an artist or for anybody who's creative or who has dreams is for that encouragement, even in times when it looks like things may, not, may or may not work out. And that encouragement came from my family, from my mother, my father, uh, for Eric, Amber, Mike, Ellen, and Shelley, and also for the staff and faculty at Utah Valley University's art department, namely Perry Stewart, Will Terry, and Bob DeWitt. And also, it, it says a lot about someone, uh, L. Ron Hubbard to give a, a foundation, to help people up. And that's an amazing thing. And I also thank those who were involved in the contest and especially Mr. Hubbard himself. And all those who have the dreams, you can do it. Thank you. Please welcome Judge Tim Powers and presenter Ellen Dubin. In our stories, uh, our, our anthology's ninth story, Gone Black, darkness and deception invade a secret army base when one soldier begins asking too many questions about an alien prisoner. The story was penned by Matthew Rotundo of Omaha, Nebraska who has since sold stories to Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show, Cosmos, and Jim Bain's Universe. Please congratulate Matthew Rotundo. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I need to thank everyone who made this contest possible, including L. Ron Hubbard, everyone at Author Services, everyone at Galaxy Press, 
all of the judges for all their time and effort. I need to particularly thank Jean Cavellos at Odyssey, uh, who helped put me on this path. I must also give a shout out to my good friend Mark Boder, whose savage, and I do mean savage, critique of this story <laughs> helped make it what it is today. And finally, I need to thank my parents who are here tonight, and my dear wife Tracy, for all their love and support through all the years. Thank you very much. Luke Eidenshrink of St. Joseph, Minnesota, brings a naturalist eye to his pen and ink specialties. He began drawing at an early age and is self-taught through exact attention to detail in multiple genres, characteristics that are appropriately give his work for gone black, rising tension, and depth. Please congratulate Luke Eidenshrink. That's a cool award. <laughs> um, I have to thank L. Ron Hubbard, of course, for giving all aspiring writers and illustrators this incredible opportunity. I'd also like to thank everybody at Author Services, Galaxy Press, and all the judges for their just incredible direction, instruction, critique these last few days. Uh, this is really a great honor. I also have to thank my parents and my partner, Nikki, for your continuing support and encouragement. Uh, thank you very much. Please welcome Judge Stephen Hickman and presenter Phil Proctor. First of all, I just want to say, very loudly obviously, <laughs> how honored Steve and I feel to be part of such a classy, inspiring, and heartwarming evening. And I, I also want to say thank you to Maliva for all of her fine work in making this happen. C.L. Holland of the United Kingdom wrote her first fantasy story at the age of seven and hasn't stopped loving the printed words since. In the anthology's tenth story, The Reflection of Memory, <laughs> C.L. takes the heroine and the reader into a looking glass world of unlimited potential and dangerous unknowns. Please, let's all applaud C.L. Holland. There are so many people to thank, so if you think you should be in this speech and you're not, consider yourself in it. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank Aaron Hubbard and everybody 
involved in this contest, for the amazing legacy that has been left to the community for science fiction and fantasy, to all the judges and guest speakers and returning winners for helping to pass that legacy on to future generations of writers. I'd like to thank my illustrator for her beautiful picture. I'd like to thank Tim Powers and Katie Wentworth for being such wonderful teachers and answering all of our questions, no matter how stupid they were. I'd like to thank everyone who's ever supported my writing over the years, but especially I'd like to thank my fiancé, Matthew, for making sure that I return to the real world every so often just to eat. <laughs> thank you all. Wow, this really is inspiring. I wish this contest had been running when I was looking for uh, illustration work. I only missed the contest by about 40 years. <laughs> Illustrator for the Reflection of Memory is a Ukrainian native, Oleksandra Baryshieva, now of New Jersey. Alexandra grew up with art and has studied it seriously all her life. She's been a multiple art award winner over the years and her skills are fully displayed in her appropriate multi-perspective drawing. Please applaud Alexandra Baryshieva. illustrators of the future arrived at this hotel, Johnny told us, this event is held by the most nicest people you will ever meet. She was so right. In just a few days, I felt like I was a part of a big family, and I want to thank L. Ron Hubbard for making it such a nice family, for making this event possible. Thank you, L. Ron Hubbard. I would also like to thank my family who are present here today, and especially my mom. I would like to wish her a happy birthday. Thank you, everyone. You're awesome. Please welcome Judge Dave Wolverton and director, screenwriter, and visual effects supervisor, Grant Boucher. The anthology's 11th story was written by Jordan Lapp of Vancouver, Canada. Jordan writes gaming software and science fiction and manages a flash fiction webzine. His winning entry, After the Final Sunset, again, burns bright as a mythic phoenix in human form prepares to face death determined not to die again. Please congratulate Jordan Lapp. Some of you know that approximately one year ago, I had a bit of a writing crisis. Due to a confluence of events in my personal life, I had actually given up writing for a while. I had entered my last story in the second quarter, and due to a postal error, it wasn't received until the third quarter, <laughs> meaning that I had to wait for six months instead of three for the results. Uh, this was disappointing, and it was the least disappointing event in my life at that time. I didn't write at all in the summer of 2008. Then I got the news that my story was a finalist, and it lit a fire under me. 
I haven't stopped writing since. I thought to myself, hey, maybe my passion isn't out of reach. Maybe I can do this thing. So for that reason, I would like to thank the contest for saving my writing career. Specifically, I would like to thank L. Ron Hubbard for paying it forward, Joni Labaki, who is an absolute asset to the field, everyone at Author Services and Galaxy Press that have been so hospitable. I'd like to thank Tim Powers and Katie Wentworth for running an awesome workshop. Absolutely, my lovely wife, Alicia. I'd marry you all over again. <laughs> and we've only been married a year. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank my family, my friends, my writing group, Camille, Jen, finish your story, Andy, <laughs> and all of the great judges and writers I've met this week. Thank you all. This experience has been incredible. Joshua Stewart of Rexburg, Idaho, fortunately gave up studying industrial welding for fine art in college, and since has gained multiple student honors. His haunting, sensitive image for After the Final Sunset Again demonstrates Joshua's painterly studied approach. Please congratulate Joshua Stewart. Wow, this is uh, really amazing. Uh, I first would like to thank my family, who have been extremely supportive in my pursuit of art. Uh, I'd like to thank Author Services and Galaxy Press for everything that they have done for us. I'd like to thank uh, Steve, Ron, Val, Cliff, and Vincent for running an amazing workshop this week, where I've learned so much. I can't, there's, words cannot describe how much I've learned from this event. I'd uh, also like to thank L. Ron Hubbard for his great generosity. And I'd just like to thank you all also. Thank you. Please welcome Judge K.D. Wentworth and presenter Josh Robert Thompson. The writer of the anthology's 12th and final story, The Farthest Born, is Gary Kloster. Gary divides his time between being a stay-at-home dad, martial artist, gamer, and creative writer. His mini-saga draws sharply from Gary's experiences describing how a young girl negotiates her family's life and death struggle with a snarling killer. Please congratulate Gary Kloster. Thank you. Thank you to my parents, my family, and friends for their support. Thank you to Bryn, my wife, my first reader. I wouldn't be here without you. I want to thank Corinne and Camille, my daughters, for being such excellent nappers and letting their daddy write. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Hubbard and the Writers of the Future Contest. Everyone at Galaxy Press and Author Services put so much work into this. It's amazing. I want to thank all the authors for giving their time to judge and the help at the workshop, especially Katie Wentworth and Tim Powers for putting up with us all week. 
And I want to thank all the other winners for being so great. I dreamed of writing as a kid. And when I found this contest when I was a kid, I sent in a couple of stories. I didn't win because they were really, really awful. Um, <laughs> but it, it was a wonderful experience, and I remembered it. So when 20 years later, I started writing again, I thought of this contest, and I looked around to see if it was still going, and it still was. And thank goodness, because they're still going, still encouraging us, still helping make dreams come true. So here's to the next 25 years. Thank you. Wow, this is awesome. Right? Am I right? Our illustrator for The Farthest Born is Mark Payton of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Mark was first exposed to art as a young boy by his grandmother and later lived in Mexico with its rich artistic heritage. Now, many years after, his 2008 resolution was to make a living with his art. It's now coming true, showcased by Mark's illustrated story snapshot. Please applaud Mark Payton. I had a prepared one, so I don't need this because I'm not going to read that. Uh, I do want to thank my parents for actually convincing me to take a speed reading course in college. It made a huge difference in everything that I do. I do also want to thank my wife for putting up with me sitting in the studio while she watched soap operas. <laughs> but uh, the point I wanted to make, and this is kind of a closing for all of this, Fifteen years ago, one of those drawings that was up there was drawn. I wanted to submit and I caved. I put it on a shelf and it sat for 15 years. Uh, 2007, as the gentleman said, I decided to get off my rear and get my career off the ground. The first thing I did was pull out that illustration, clean it up, made two more and submitted it. Two weeks later, I got a call and I was surprised beyond belief. So the point I'm trying to make is to all of those who are paying attention out there, get off your butt and submit something. You can have a career too. Ladies and gentlemen, to present the Gold Award for Illustrator of the Year, please welcome Ron Lindon and Sophia Milos. Good evening. The L. Ron Hubbard Gold Award for Illustrator of the Year bestows an additional honor on one of these talented artists to further recognize that individual's outstanding accomplishment. So now the L. Ron Hubbard Gold Award goes to the illustrator of the story. The Reflection of Memory, Alexandra Bereshiva. As the director of the L. Ron Hubbard Writers and Illustrators of the Future Contest, I am very pleased to present you with this check for $5,000.
like a mix of Holly Berry getting the Oscars and Gollum from Lord of the Rings. My precious. Wow. This is amazing. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elron Hubbard. Thank you, judges. Thank you, instructors. This is such a great opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to present the L. Ron Hubbard Gold Award for the Writers of the Future contest, please welcome K.D. Wentworth and Dion Graham. Wow, what a thrill, what a thrill. So, the L. Ron Hubbard Gold Award for Writer of the Year bestows an additional honor on one of these talented artists to further recognize that individual's outstanding accomplishments. The L. Ron Hubbard Gold Award goes to the writer of the story, The Garden of TNZ, and that writer is Emery Wong. As the director of the L. Ron Hubbard Writers and Illustrators of the Future Contest, I'm very pleased to present you with this check for $5,000. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank L. Ron Hubbard once again, because just it's such a tremendous opportunity. I don't see anything like it in the genre or any other genre. And yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for this honor. Um, it's been an unforgettable week. Everyone here is so talented and knowledgeable. Pretty much every conversation I've had has left me humbled. And also just getting to know my fellow writers in the contest has generated so much excitement for me as an artist. Like just all the cool things everyone is doing really inspires me to keep working harder. And I really just look forward to following everybody's progress as a professional. Thank you. This marks the end of the event celebrating our silver anniversary of the L. Ron Hubbard Achievement Awards and the launch of the next 25 years for writers and illustrators of the future, which, in the words of Publishers Weekly, is the most enduring forum to showcase new talent in the genre. As L. Ron Hubbard stated at the close of his essay in Writers of the Future, Volume 1, my heartiest congratulations to those selected for this first volume. I'm very proud to present the winners. Good luck to all other writers of the future, and good reading. Thank you all. Please join us now in the Oscar room for the reception in honor of our new winners, and get your book personally signed by them at the signing table. Thank you. Thank you.